Good evening, all. Um, welcome to the Bilkent IR Talks. Uh, tonight, we are hosting a very distinguished uh, professor of political science and international relations, Professor uh, Birol Yeshilada from Portland State University is with us. Um, let me, uh, before I, uh, I read his uh, biography, um, welcome, Ojam. Thank you very much uh, for Thank being you with us. It's always good to be with you. Thank you, Ojam. And uh, Biroloja is no uh, stranger to Ankara. Actually, he taught at our neighboring university during the early 1990s, and uh, he knows Bilkent very well. Um, Hojam, let me just read your uh, biography very quickly. Um, Dr. Birol Yeshilada is the director of the Mark O. Hatfield School of Government and is professor of political science and international studies at Portland State University. He also holds the endowed chair in contemporary Turkish studies and he is director of the National Center of Academic Excellence in Cybersecurity at the Portland State University. He is past vice president of the International Studies Association and is member of the Board of Trans Research Consortium. Uh, previously, he served as director of the Middle East Studies Center at PSU. And Dr. Yeshilada came to PSU in September 1998 from University of Missouri at Columbia, where he was chair of the Department of Political Science. Dr. Yeshilada received his BA degree in 1977 in neurobiology from the University of California at Berkeley, his MA in political science from San Francisco State University, and his PhD in political science in 84 from the University of Michigan. His current research interests include global power transition, the European Union, political and economic development of Turkey, radical Islam and terrorism, the, sorry, the Cyprus negotiations and international conflict resolution, and politics of economic reform in the emerging markets. He is the principal investigator of, investigator of the World Value Survey Project in Cyprus, his recent publications include several books, such as Global Power Transition and the Future of the European Union, EU-Turkey Relations in the 21st Century, Islamization of Turkey under AKP rule, the Emerging European Union, Comparative Political Parties and Party Elites, and over 30 articles and book chapters. He is the former co-editor-in-chief of International Studies Perspectives and former associate editor of Middle East Studies Association Bulletin. Ojam, thank you very much again. And the title of your talk today is Global Power Transition and the Determinants of EU Integration. Floor is yours. Thank you, Özgür. It's always uh, a pleasure to be with you. And I thank everyone for the invitation. Uh, it's. I wish I could be there doing this in person, but unfortunately it will be a while before I can uh, see any future uh, light for travel overseas. As you can imagine, the, the pandemic is causing havoc here as well, uh, not just in Turkey. And we are literally under no travel orders by the university. We can't even go to any conference. Um, and it was a real challenge to have the ISA conference virtually this year. Uh, but we pulled it off. Uh, it was a, it was quite a success, and I'm always delighted to see young scholars from Turkey at ISA conferences. It, it's a, it's a bright light for me. Uh, and again, thank you so much for inviting me to share my work with you today. I'll be talking about uh, power transition theory as it relates to future of European Union, and uh, share with you some of our. Uh, work in determining, uh, empirically determining um, what uh, uh, independent uh, factors contribute to deepening of integration in Europe. And, and our goal is to further this study uh, and test it in other regional integration cases, because uh, any theory just for Europe is no theory. It needs to be tested everywhere. 
the power transition theory is not a, uh, a, a new theory in, in and of itself. Uh, it uh, considers um, uh, relations between global hierarchy of nation states, as well as regional hierarchies. Uh, you're all familiar with the works of realists where uh, power transition takes place when a, a challenger rises and challenges the preponderant power. The power transition theory originated with the works of the late Ken Organsky uh, at University of Michigan, and I and others like Yatsik Kukler and Ron Tamman and our uh, former students like Doug Lemke, uh, Gaspar Jenna, and others are carrying on the research and expanding its implications and measures. The basic difference between power transition theory, which is a political economy approach, actually it's, it's larger than that as we now include more determinants of measuring power uh, of states uh, to include political demography, as well as economics and military might. Uh, that's our main difference in measurement from the realists. And also the biggest difference is that realists assume that when a uh, challenger reaches parity with the preponderant country that you will have a major clash and a catastrophic war, which will result, most likely result in one new hegemon emerging from this. There is absolutely no solid empirical evidence behind this that it always has to be that way. Of course, you have clashes, but there have been many times in global politics when the challenger reached parity and took over uh, the transition successfully without fighting. The end of the 19th century, United States overtook Britain as the hegemon in world politics. Uh, that did not result in war between the two. Um, Soviet Union was never at the point of parity with the United States, despite being a nuclear power. And that was not a case of uh, transition, power transition. Uh, what you see here on this slide is the current global hierarchy with regional hierarchies. The global hierarchy is the United States, China, EU. Russia is way down in that hierarchy, really. I would even put India above Russia. And then the other cones are the regional hierarchies, the EU hierarchy led by Germany, France, then Italy and Poland is where we're gonna be looking. The same implications of power transition can be applied regionally. What goes into our estimate of relative power, capacity of states is this uh, cycle. Extraction of resources by government, that's the mobilization of workforce and extraction of revenue in the form of taxation. That is a very complex uh, estimation because just going after taxes for the sake of taxation will not get you anywhere. 100% uh, tax gives you zero revenue, 0% 0 tax gives you zero revenue. Uh, I will have no incentive to work if taxation uh, takes away my earnings. The second is ability to reach and mobilize the workforce. Uh, do, what kind of a workforce do you have? Population here becomes very important. The size of population we used to assume in the old days, and I can go way back to the days of dinosaurs in academia, um, was assumed that the large population is an asset. It could be a liability, uh, just as um, the other way around. If you have a large workforce that's educated, trained, and productive, yes, that is an asset. But having a large workforce that is ignorant, unskilled, unhealthy, then that is a liability. Likewise, consider the case of Israel, a tiny country, small population, so the size of the population is a liability, but it maintains a very high level of education and skill task oriented workforce. That becomes a positive contribution. So the 
uh, ability to mobilize and, 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 and engage the workforce in productive ways is an important measurement that we actually work with the experts in World Bank and places like uh, Goldman Sachs constantly comparing these. And recently uh, we have exchanged uh, data with Ajemoli at Harvard uh, to compare contrast uh, our work, which is quite promising. Now, the last part that makes a huge difference in a country's future is allocation. In other words, reallocation of resources. Where are you putting the money? Okay. Uh, are you investing in your people? Are you investing in production or are you wasting your money? United States today faces a tremendous challenge uh, as a declining hegemon. Uh, it is not reallocating resources effectively. And in fact, when you look at the performance of nations uh, in, in the measure of uh, performance of states, United States ranks very low compared to many other countries. How does this translate into global phenomenon? What you see here is the graph estimating um, productivity is the size of the uh, line and position of the line for each country represents a relative share of global output uh, in the world. The dark blue is the United States, light blue is European Union followed by green, that's India. And then you have Russia. And then right below Russia, the, the light purple is the UK. We separated it, as you see, from the European Union. And UK, in, in my opinion, committed a, a grave mistake by leaving the European Union. Now, it was never a fully committed member of the EU. It was always a one foot in, one foot out, love-hate relationship, and always opting out of uh, treaties. Uh, but by itself, UK is a uh, non-starter in global hierarchy now. The brown is China. And today, depending on how we measure uh, per capita productivity, and purchasing power parity is how we are standardizing the data. We can say that China has reached parity with the United States and if it hasn't in the next two years, it will. And it will take over the US as the largest economy in the world. Now, here's the, here's the big thing. Never before in world history has any hegemon not uh, was not at the same time the richest country in the world. China, as you see, will not have the per capita productivity based on that, the size of that line, that curve, that United States and European Union will maintain. Now, United States will increase its productivity, but European Union is not. In fact, European Union is in big trouble as we project out more and the significance of the projection becomes uh, ludicrous actually. Uh, we see a trend in Europe of declining productivity. And here I would say <clears throat> one of the most important new determinants that we have realized is what uh, one of our new students has labeled silver tsunami in the European Union. What that means is aging population and low fertility rate. So European Union uh, desperately needs immigration policy. And that lack of effective rational immigration policy in European Union uh, is standing in the way of bringing new workforce into the EU, which they desperately need. Uh, short of that, European Union will continue to decline economically relative to United States, India, and uh, China. Far more serious uh, decline than the United States. 
Um, I have a student right now writing a dissertation on immigration and refugee policy in the EU, and the future does not look good. And I will share some of uh, our results with you as well. The biggest mistake European Union did in the 1990s, um, and I've, I've, I've been arguing this since the early 90s when I uh, started um, looking into EU enlargement, was uh, the mistake was not admitting U Ukraine and Turkey simultaneously into the EU. All of our estimations showed that if those two countries were admitted into the EU, EU would have reversed its economic decline uh, relative to rise of China and the United States and India. But instead of doing that, they admitted uh, 12 Central and Eastern European countries and their in contribution to the EU population growth was one third, raised it to over half a billion people. But the economic uh, contribution of all those countries, including a middle power like uh, Poland to overall EU productivity was no more than five to 8%. And in addition, it changed the balance of the center of gravity of North-South economic divergence in the EU from South to East. So now you had all the Southern European EU countries in the Mediterranean regions, Spain and Portugal included, arguing with Central and Eastern European countries over the uh, structural funds and development funds. And as you know, European Union does not have a huge budget. Uh, that's where the big challenge is. It does not have a political union. It doesn't have a treasury department. It does have a central bank, but it has no fiscal union, which is the last stage of integration. Within the EU and European theater, this is the uh, hierarchy, uh, Germany, France and UK, um, Turkey, Italy, Spain, Poland, Netherlands, Sweden, and so forth. Uh, you can imagine if Turkey was a member of the EU, what kind of economic boom that would contribute um, to the EU productivity. In fact, given the young uh, nature of Turkey's workforce, that would have also helped uh, immensely with the the lack of uh, working population, declining working population in the European Union. Uh, one last thing I want to mention here before I forget is that there is also something else happening in the values changes in the European Union and all around the world. And we haven't included this in the research yet, but we're looking for ways of uh, including it in, in the next level of analysis. What we have noticed, and this came to me as a research idea from Professor <coughs> Vaisel Boskurt at Istanbul University when he was visiting Portland State, he's a sociologist economist, about work ethic. Uh, the Puritan work ethic, what's happening to it in the advanced democracies vis-a-vis -vis other countries. And we found using the World Value Survey that in the post-industrial societies, the emphasis on work is declining, whereas it is increasing in the emerging markets. How does that further affect productivity in these countries like European Union and Canada and the United States relative to rising powers? So particularly when you consider the work ethic in China and uh, places like Korea. So that we found some significant evidence here that there is a tremendous shift in affecting productivity. So that also needs to be brought into the research. European Union further faces a tremendous challenge in having a two-track integration, which in my view is a terrible mistake because they declared economic monetary union and signed the Maastricht Treaty uh, before even completing the common market. The economist in me says that that was a very bad decision. You need to complete every stage of economic integration before you move into the next one. But uh, the times required it, the security concerns and though the Cold War, they jumped into it. And now we have a Eurozone and non-Eurozone uh, two-track European Union. 
this is just the map. In addition, we have different commitments of the European Union and European countries uh, associated with the EU. Uh, some are in Schengen, some are in customs union, some are in economic area, others are in the EU, others are in the Eurozone. This is a very messy mix. And it adds to complications in integration as this funny animal um, it, called the European Union tries to muddle along and, and move forward. As good, you know, uh, the late David Wood uh, at University of Missouri, when David and I were uh, first working on our book on European Union in the early 1990s, we looked at this thing and he said, you know, this is, this is a real a weird thing. European Union is not a country. It's an international organization. I don't know how in the world the comparative politics people came to own European Union. First, they didn't know what to do with it. They used to put it as a chapter at the end of comparative politics of Western Europe. And now they say, we own it. I was talking to uh, <laughs> Caporasso the other day and he said, I don't get it either. Uh, Jim is a former president of ISA and European Union Studies Association. It emerged in the international relations. In fact, the first time we were able to sell our uh, textbook on the EU to uh, Longman to convince them to publish it was that it would be a good book between comparative politics and international organizations and IR. Well, so what did we call it? It's a funny, uh, it's an international organization with state-like aspirations. Good luck, because once you reach the level of political union, then the last bastion of sovereignty stands in the way. That's political sovereignty. So um, <clears throat> let me jump ahead of this. This, is, this shows you where you can have power distribution, uh, conflict integration, or trust. Uh, it's, it's worth mentioning it. And another difference between uh, realist and power transition theory is right here. We in power transition have shown that when countries, the preponderant country and the challenger are satisfied with each other, satisfied with the rules of the game in the international system, war does not occur. In fact, they cooperate and they move forward. When they are dissatisfied, if both are dis dissatisfied, you would have a global war. When the challenger is dissatisfied and reaches parity, the risk of war increases, okay? So that's the key difference. The $64,000 question is, how do you measure satisfaction? That has been the Achilles heel of power transition theory until recently. And we have this uh, proven formula that uh, shows the probability of conflict or cooperation between any two countries, any dyad. Um, and until our last work, we never quite measured satisfaction. We always looked at it in the form of arms race, but that's not enough. It's not enough, you need more than that. And what I'm gonna share with you uh, as a measure of satisfaction in, in our recent work is only a, a, a glimmer of hope. We're gonna be, it's significant results, but we need to do other things uh, to measure it. We have always measured the way in which conflict increases between diets from neutrality, neutral relations to, um, gradual expansion of hostilities to war. But we have never been able to move in the other direction to show, <coughs> excuse me, how cooperation could lead to better relations. And regional integration, uh, we believe, 
is a way of looking at that. Just like in the post uh, World War II, Charles Kindleberger and Ken Organsky said, uh, you need a regional uh, or a global leader to bring everybody together in a satisfied system. So the role of a regional leader was important as well. Okay, but the EU faces amazing problems. Brexit left. Is it a good thing or a bad thing? Financial crisis. You know, EU has not really recovered from the financial crisis of 2008. And on top of it, now there is the COVID crisis adding to it. It has immigration policy problems, migrants, refugees, common foreign and security policy. All of these stand in the way of creating further problems for the EU. And they have to tackle these effectively if they want to have a harmonious uh, future. Now, we are using integration measure that comes from economics, international economics, adopted to <clears throat> six categories of integration using a Gutman scale or free movement of goods, services, capital, free movement of labor, supranational institutions, presence of them, treaties, et cetera, monetary coordination and fiscal coordination. And uh, we have created levels of integration based on that. So that is how we expand this continuum of <clears throat> integration to conflict. We can measure um, total war, conflict, data goes way back to 1812, correlates of war project and others. Uh, integration data is fairly new. And we can take it back in Europe uh, to 1960 effectively, um, but other regions, we really don't have much uh, of, of data. And Professor Gaspar Jena is working on this in Texas. So these are, uh, I can share this with you later if anybody wants it. All the things that go into measuring the different um, aspects of integration achievement score, okay? Independent variables, <clears throat> we take the presence of a regional power, just like a global power. The hypothesis is that at the onset of integration, you need somebody to push it forward. And we have done tests over time, whether it is Germany, whether it is France, and it's always uh, either West Germany or today Germany, relative to other countries in the union. And this shows a German hierarchy uh, in the EU. Notice that there's a line there, 2019, just about where the German hierarchy, which was flat since 2004, jumps up. That's Brexit. You take Britain out of it, German hierarchy increases slightly. The second one is convergence of social values. And this is basically political sociology. How do we uh, measure whether or not these societies that are coming together share some set of values we can call European values? The idea came to us, <coughs> excuse me, from one of my former professors, Professor Ronald Engelhardt at University of Michigan, the father of European Value Survey and World Value Survey. And I was talking to him about this and I said, you know, how can we do this? Can we see that there is a set of values that we can say that are European? Well, it's not just European. Uh, it would be measure of secular traditional values and postmodern or post-industrial values to uh, survivalist values. And those indices are <clears throat> calculated from the World Value Survey by Engelhardt and Christian Belzo. And here's the map. So I know it's a little bit uh, complex, 
but the lines show <clears throat> average weights, factor weights across those dimensions. The X axis is, um, it goes from traditional values to secular values and the Y axis goes from materialist survivalist values to top post-industrial values. And the line is different waves of world value survey uh, results. And as you can see, <clears throat> the top right um, square is where we find most of the EU countries. And at the bottom right are the post-communist countries, secular but survivalist, very different set of values. But there is some movement towards the top. At the top uh, bottom left, you find countries like Turkey. And Poland was there, but Poland recently moved into the top left. Uh, Ersin Kalajdzoğlu and I used to joke about Poland and Turkey dancing together in the lower left, uh, just wandering around when everybody else was in the other quadrant and sort of a funny mix. And <clears throat> I mean, Tom Volge looked at this and said, this shows me without you telling me any, any, anything else, why Turkey will never join the EU. And I had to explain that to him, you know, what, what might that mean? Um, <clears throat> Tom Bolgi is the former executive director of ISA. But, you know, for example, sociologists have been telling us forever that Americans are more religious than the Europeans. Now we can show it, it's right there. United States in the top left with Canada. And Britain is actually moving in that direction too. Very interesting. So uh, convergence of values, what does that mean? Does that mean anything for ability for uh, countries to further integration in the EU? We wanted to test that as well. And this is the distance. You can actually measure the distance of values between countries. And if you see, I wanted to show you this because I'm talking to colleagues in Turkey right now, how far Turkey's average values are away from uh, Western Europeans. This doesn't mean that there aren't post-industrial values in Turkey. They're just, just drowned in the sea of more traditional and survivalist values, <clears throat> okay? You can actually go further into these analyses, country by country, and flesh it out. And you will see there are, there are uh, post-industrial values in Turkey. And that is the, what I would call uh, culture camps and uh, culture clashes that you're seeing in Turkey today. Um, trust. How did we measure trust? This is trust of countries in the EU. Okay, satisfaction. We took that as a proxy of satisfaction. And that data goes back to 1972. Luckily, the European Commission measures satisfaction every six months in every country. Uh, confidence or trust in EU institutions. Okay, if I were doing this globally, I would say, satisfaction with the international organizations uh, or satisfaction with the UN. Um, trust, let me jump ahead of this. We were looking at German and EU average trust in the commission. Uh, it's so-so uh, in Germany. And here are the results that are important. Uh, multinomial regression analysis. Uh, these are categorical variables. Uh, R square is pretty good, 58, 64%. Uh, it gives us some hope. Um, on the left column, you see the stages of economic integration from lowest is free trade area. Next is customs union, then common market, economic union, then economic and monetary union. 
those are the existing levels of integration. These are measured every diet in the EU relative to integration. And then you see the independent variables. Um, you see that hierarchy is important at the beginning uh, in the free trade area. That means having a regional leader is very important. And second is customs union that happened in the EU in the 1960s. Uh, trust becomes significant along with hierarchy. Common market, <clears throat> we started seeing the rise of value convergence. A common market in the European Union was not achieved until actually 1994, even though it was called Project 1992. Economic Union, we see again, uh, all three independent variables important, but once we get deeper into EMU, guess what drops out? Hierarchy, because now, it is irrelevant to have a single regional leader to push it further. A lot of countries have come to the level of the, uh, uh, if you will, the regional hegemon. So it's more of a collective decision to move further along. And this signals that for moving further into political fiscal union in the European Union, is not going to depend on a single country or even two countries. We talked today about a German, Franco-German leadership in the EU to convince everybody else to come along. It is going to take hell of a lot more than that. Now, why are values important and trust? Because today, as you went through these integration process in the EU, you have to recognize one other factor. At the beginning, this was a political elite idea was not people's mission. In the 1980s, <clears throat> it was an attempt to move further and achieve the common market because big business got in the play, led by big business lobby in, in Brussels. Everybody uh, claims that Jacques Delors was behind the single European act and pushed the EU for changes in the voting, et cetera. That's nonsense. It was the result of a big business lobby pressuring Jacques Delors and others, led by the former late uh, president of Fiat uh, to convince the politicians that it is time to deliver the common market, which was the original intent of the Treaty of Rome. Uh, and that's a factual statement. Now, past that, we see people getting involved now. As you see in the changes in the institutions of the EU, the EU Parliament having more say in collective decision making as, uh, as an institution, people having direct access to lobbying uh, under the uh, Nice Treaty. So now it affects everybody and it only makes sense. The deeper the integration, the more it touches individual citizens of the EU. So what started originally as a political elite experiment has now become a comprehensive everybody's business. And that's where values become important and trust in institutions become important. Unfortunately for the EU, they have tremendous obstacles and obstacles that are creating the notion of clashes between tribalism, if you will, and universalism in the EU. People looking for their uh, own selfish benefits in, in the face of growing challenges and difficulties versus what's good for the benefit of a collective. Uh, co you know, this reminds me of, of the late Munker Olson's uh, book on public choice, uh, collective decision-making and, and groups. So then we looked at how, will, how is Brexit going to impact integration? And we saw that uh, the highlighted points show 
movement towards further integration, uh, something uh, that we can see in, in the Eurozone with and partial financial integration, you need to have high level of trust to move further. Normal trust level is the average we have. What we did with this was we took the trust levels and we said, all right, if we move on with the moving average, where do we go in the next three, four years? If it declines by 3%, what happens? And if, it, if the trust increases by 3%, what do we see? That's what we see there. Low trust, normal trust, and high trust, okay? And we see that for economic union countries, uh, Poland, Sweden, uh, Romania, and so forth, you need a real high trust, further increase uh, to get there. Um, whereas, for the other uh, countries, um, yeah, that EMU, the high trust will speed up the integration pr process. But honestly, looking at the events in European Union last year or so, I don't see high trust increasing. Um, and I, I'm, I am curious what the next uh, Eurobarometer is going to show in terms of trust. Oops. And this is the way we can see uh, whether it's going to be um, the two different um, directions political union could be achieved or, or not in the European Union. You are going to need um, basically a reinforcement by increasing trust to reach political union. And by political union here, I don't mean a complete federation. I mean, a, a more of a fiscal union. Um, so how do you increase trust among egotists, if you will, to further deep in integration, especially when you're faced with this pandemic and more constraints on the EU? Um, if you look at what happened with the uh, pandemic, shutting down the borders. I mean, look, when the borders were shut down and in the countries were just going at it alone, it threatened the Schengen Treaty. And without Schengen, there is no EU. It's that simple. The European Union, Eurozone GDP declined by 12% in the last year's first two quarters. Greece and Portugal contracted by 10%, Italy nine, and, and the list goes on. And it doesn't look uh, bright for the uh, current uh, year either. EU introduced some bailout kind of support and that took forever. 1.1 trillion euros was the package. But when you look at the bottom line of what that means, it's again a one-off approach. There is nothing there that addresses what are we going to do if we have another crisis like this? Can we do another one-off? What does that mean? Kicking the can down the road. In the European Union, there is no treasury department. In the United States, there is a treasury department. There is a huge federal budget. There is no huge federal budget in the EU. Uh, the budget of uh, Germany dwarfs EU's budget. So short of a, a federal structure, where you have these institutions, the lender of last resort uh, sort of thing. How do you move forward and maintain harmony and cohesion in the European Union? And <clears throat> I have some results that we did an agent-based analysis on preferences of countries that I can come to later. I'm taking too much time. 
I can show you those results if you're interested. Uh, we run a century in analysis with Kugler on this. And it just shows that it's going to be same old, same old. So given these challenges that the EU is facing, I would just conclude by saying that uh, God help them if there is another financial crisis within the next 12 months. Uh, they're barely holding together. Uh, and in addition, the refugee immigration problem is mounting. Uh, the harmony on common foreign security policy is lacking. Individual countries are being um, uh, affected by social engineering through uh, cyber attacks. And just like in the United States, rise of right-wing populism in Europe threatens harmony uh, and cohesion of the societies. So these are not uh, anything that we can just sneer at and say, oh, no, no big deal. These, in fact, uh, hold the future of integration in the EU. So with that, I will stop Özgür and uh, take any questions, comments, and I'm pretty open to comments, critique, anything you want to throw at me. That's fine. Thank you very much. <clears throat> Thank you very much, Ajahn. It was a great pleasure to listen to your talk. The research is most interesting. Um, I will open the floor for questions. Ajahn? First of all, I would like to thank you, Mr. Yeshilada, for a great presentation. I actually would like to ask uh, for the concept of cohesion because I actually uh, was thinking about the vaccine crisis in the EU right now. There is like uh, a statement that many of the richer countries, even in the EU, gets the most um, vaccine, and the countries in the EU which actually live in the lower income actually gets less. So I would like to ask that how it 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 is actually an absolute gain if it if maybe like without the regulation of the EU, the countries would have been better or if actually like <clears throat> they were be a, or build an alliance with another countries outside of the EU. So how actually the band, bandwagoning will be efficient for the lower income EU countries if actually there are some other options? I would like to hear your opinion. Thank yeah. You. <coughs> Um, you are absolutely right. It is one of the fundamental problems of governance in the EU, the complexity of decision making and the relationship between supranational institutions and, and national governments. And this is the ugly face of capitalism, in my opinion, and it's a global one where we all know nobody is safe until everybody is safe with the pandemic. But the rich countries are able to pull it off. And the <coughs> economic system that we all follow uh, through these countries is that corporate interest um, trump um, public interests. In other words, in a case like this, when you have a discovery of vaccines, it would have made a lot of sense for rich governments and EU as a collective from the uh, top level, step in, pay the corporations the billions they want and take the patents and distribute the vaccine mass and mass distribution of the vaccine. And that is not happening. It obviously violates the uh, free market principles. Yes, we get it, all right? Uh, we get that, but does it make sense? So rich get it and the poor don't. And the distribution shows that even here in the United States, we had the same problem, <coughs> even here. Uh, it, it's, it's just mind-boggling 
But if you look at the global division, the north-south, it's it's just pathetic. Um, so in, in my opinion, it is a failure in the EU to have an effective coordination of vaccine distribution. And in, at the same time, uh, it is really uh, troubling me how all these advanced democracies are failing. It's not just uh, here. Um, if you looked at, have you looked at Canada lately? Um, European Union countries, it's just unbelievable. So are their political capacities so low that they couldn't handle a pandemic like this? This is where the performance of nations measures we have uh, can give you some uh, uh, answers. And we have, we have that data if you, if you like to have access to it. It's readily available on our web page and Trans Research Consortium. Um, Gizam? Uh, Biroz Hocam, thank you for being here. Uh, my question will be about the effect of uh, COVID-19 in the EU integration you touch upon. Uh, can you a little bit elaborate on that? Uh, in, in COVID what? I'm sorry, I didn't quite catch it. Uh, COVID-19 and the, its effect on uh, European Union integration. It's causing a further polarization in the European Union. Um, I would watch a couple of things. The unilateral decisions of member states to uh, control borders is one thing that I would be very uh, cautious about. And that's because of the significance of Schengen and what it means of freedom of movement of people. Um, it's one thing to have a coordinated control of borders that is EU-wide. It's another thing for unilateral shutdown uh, with complete disregard of everybody else. Um, so it's a give and take between the uh, member states, right? I would look for that. But the second thing, that I, and, and for me, this is more uh, concerning, is how is the ineffectiveness of vaccine distribution affecting people's perception of the EU. And I bet you this is going to come up in the next surveys in the European Union. If the Eurobarometer doesn't ask it, I know that my colleagues in European values will be asking this and world values in the next wave. Just like we did about the financial crisis of 2008, we changed the surveys to address the impact of financial crisis on attitudes, values, and beliefs of individuals. So we, we may just have some antidotal results right now, but the uh, more concrete results will, will come further uh, down the road when we do more um, scientific study. And I really think there is a wide open field here for uh, young scholars like yourselves to jump into and measure and do some. So this is this is the essence of policy impact um, on uh, people, and we know that trust or lack of trust has a huge effect. On, on holding societies together. It's always like that, even, it's the never ending thing. I was just lecturing on game theory last night and in Prisoner's Dilemma, what is the missing link? Trust. If you don't have trust, you're gonna end up in war, okay? And especially if you don't have dialogue and on top of it, you have mistrust. So how do you build trust? Well, to build trust in the EU, across the EU, you have to deliver public goods. It's, it sounds simple. It isn't simple, but it's really, that is the bottom line. 
what are you giving? Why are you making my life better or worse as EU? When I first started looking at the EU in the 80s, and I admit I was one of those students in graduate school saying, it's a dead horse. And I used to joke with Engelhardt, why are you studying this dead horse? It's over. And he, he, he will, to the day he would die, he would remind me of that. Because when I came back from Europe after uh, 1987, I was in Ankara and Brussels. And I said, hey, something is happening in Europe and we're, we need to do something. Wake up America. And we organized the European Community Studies Association. Ever since that time, he reminds me of what I said. Uh, but to get there, you need to get these uh, selfish governments to cooperate. It's not an easy task. And there is a huge role here for the EU as EU institutions to do that. Um, Ali Arslan? Uh, do you hear me clearly? Yes, yes I can hear you. Um, okay. Okay. Uh, I want to uh, first thank you for this great talk today. Uh, it was beautiful. And my question will be on um, the mechanism created by satisfaction, trust, and power. Uh, if I want to analyze a different region um, where regime type is different, uh, should I um, change something on these three factors or should I add more factors or should I remove some like trust? Uh, the broader okay. question, you can take the broad the question is, does regime type influence the importances of satisfaction, trust and power respectively? Uh, we looked into that, Ali Arslan. We looked into regime type as a measure as well, because as you know, uh, democratic peace theory says, you know, democracies don't fight. There is some um, evidence as well that autocracies don't fight either. Likewise, countries come together. Uh, we looked into that as a measure as well. We also looked at trade, financial investments across the borders and so forth. Those are all good things to further add to the mix, okay? I would keep trust there. Trust is very important. How do you measure trust is crucial. Now, I would direct you to look at other regional barometers. And there's Arab barometer, Latin barometer, Asia barometer, and see if they ask questions about confidence in regional institutions. Okay. Here's the key Latin America has. A, a, a beautiful agreement for a complete regional union, but nothing is happening there. Why is it happening in the EU and not there? And this is the never ending question. And people say, well, Europeans are alike. And I've been hearing this for 40 years. Well, really, these are the people who gave us two world wars, 100 year war. What are you talking about? There's something else happening. So, then you may say, well, what results in trust? Well, you can't, you know, the more questions you ask, the more you will get, right? I would keep political capacity in there as a measure, in, in, in a hierarchical measure of these states. That data set is available. You can contact Professor uh, Ali uh, Fisunolu in St. Louis. Uh, university, tell him I uh, recommend it, you contact him. He is our data master for the Trans Research Consortium, and he can share all of them with you. It's a huge data set that's been put together over, God knows, uh, since the 1970s and gets updated all the time. So performance Political capacity, I would keep there to measure hierarchies. Um, <clears throat> integration achievement score, that is solid. That is absolutely solid data. 
And Gaspar Jenna is the father of that study. He's also part of the project. Um, but I would look in other regions. You have to test these things across regions. Otherwise, it doesn't make any sense. Okay. Thank you, Jam. I could take it. Hi, sir. Uh, thanks for the talk. It was very informative. Uh, my question will be about um, the fiscal union of the European uh, countries. You said that the uh, EU countries should unite under the fiscal union so that they could have better implications uh, on their integrated economy um, together with the, uh, with the um, monetary union. Uh, but uh, do you think if it will better work out for European countries if they drop a euro as the main currency? Because uh, I think the uh, fiscal union will um, create more integrated Europe where the sovereign countries will lose their sovereignty. And this might result um, uh, in a backflash because if we consider the uh, populist countries um, such as um, Hungary or France, uh, because Le Pen might be elected uh, in the next elections. So do you think if um, dropping out the euro uh, would better um, work out for European countries? Because I think for now, what EU should do maybe to lower the extent of the supranationality of the uh, EU, but create a more intergovernmental institution. Because um, what I believe in this sense, the, uh, in, um, the deregulation of the economic policies in uh, world politics and also within the EU um, does um, decrease the scope of governments to, per uh, to perform what they should uh, in general sense. Thank you. Well, that's a tough one uh, because it depends on what kind of European Union you want to see at the end of the day. Okay. The, it, it, it's <clears throat> this discussion of single currency. Remember uh, when the Maastricht Treaty was being discussed, should the EU have EMU or stay as a common market? In those days, there were only 12 countries. Um, uh, at stake. The problem is if you don't have a single currency, you're making banks and financial institutions rich, all our people. The cost is on the individual consumer, transaction costs. And now with 27 countries, 20, 27 transaction costs. That's a huge loss, wasted money for reallocation. Every time you cross the border, you have to. Every time you buy and sell, you have to convert. There's always a transaction cost. So there was a huge debate between American economists and European economists, whether or not EU needed a single currency. Yes, it needs a single currency, but it doesn't end there. There is a iron cloud rule. You cannot have a monetary union without a political union. Um, Professor William Riker, not <laughs> Star Trek, okay? <laughs> Way back in the 1960s. Anala examined the emergence of America and why the Articles of Confederation did not have any hope of survival. Um, it takes a big financial crisis to show that if you don't have the political institutions to support a monetary union, you will collapse. The only reason the EU is standing right now is its rich country's ability to throw money into the pot with these one-off regulations and one-off financial uh, impetus 
uh, injecting money to kick the can down the road. And that becomes a further uh, uh, trouble in terms of building trust across societies. For example, if you look back to the 2019, 2008 and 2009 crisis, remember when Greece went bust, the finance uh, minister of Greece was saying, they owe it to us. They need to bail us out. They need to just give us money and we deserve it because we are all one country, one European Union. And the German position, public position, was like, go jump in a lake. Why should I be bailing you out? This has always been an issue. The Germans are already fed up with the fact that they're paying, they've been taxed in the West German uh, states to still pay for East German states to be harmonize with the rest of Germany. And on top of it, you're asking them to bail out the Greeks, the Italians, the Spaniards, the Portuguese, that doesn't go far, okay? Because fundamentally, even though you have a European Union, you still have these identity issues. If you look at the identity measures in these surveys, there's still a huge gap. When you control for age demographics, yes, more and more younger people are saying, I am European first, but there's still a huge part of the population that still identifies with national identity first and European identity second. So there's a long way to go. And unfortunately, you have another financial crisis right now. I worry that a third financial crisis may break the bank, if you will. The ability to find more resources to bail out everybody. It's not sustainable. At some point, they have to have either a fiscal union, push that through. I don't know how they're gonna do that, okay? Because all the results I see right now is saying same old, same old. Nothing else is stable. Uh, or revert back to less than a uh, uh, an integrated EU that we know today. Step back and rebuild again. And that is a huge cost. Let me sh share one other thing with you. I mean, for example, uh, in the uh, horrible days of Trump, when Trump was pushing the Europeans to increase this and increase that in defense spending, it's not possible because there are financial agreements, treaties in place that says, you cannot go beyond this level of spending in the EU, okay? On top of it, there is no such thing as a euro bond, like American treasury bonds. And there, that's a big debate in the European Union. Should we be issuing European bonds? Well, you don't have a treasury department. How are you gonna issue a European treasury bond when you don't have a treasury department? You have individual countries issuing their bonds, but your central bank by treaty is not supposed to be buying those in the primary markets. It buys them in the secondary markets. These are all the complications of jumping way ahead of integration process without completing the previous parts. And now, um, you know, the famous analogy, the chickens have come home to roost. Um, Ojam, thank you. We are quite a bit of um, over time. Uh, do you have a time? Do I have time for maybe one more question or something? Sure, like that? absolutely. 
Okay, then maybe one more um, question. Um, um, our professors didn't ask a question, so I will uh, give the priority to Eliza Oja uh, for the last question. I feel bad to take the students' place, so I'm happy to. Don't don't worry, don't worry about okay. it. <laughs> uh, thank you very much, Professor uh, Professor Ishal Ada, for your very interesting talk. Uh, my question has to do with um, a point you made earlier about the horrible days of Trump, uh, but also uh, what are what is currently going on in in Europe. It feels like uh, the nightmare is not over. Um, how do you think the EU can create a political union without a military union? And what kind of effect does NATO's presence uh, and NATO's existence have on Europe's ability to stand on its own feet on the military front? Yeah, excellent question, um, Elisa. It's excellent question. We looked into this extensively over the years. Common foreign and security policy is an under fundamental challenge of integration. And now without the UK in the mix, it would be easier to have a more common policy in the EU, but that can no longer be viewed as a standalone without NATO. And part of that reason, the reason is simple. Financially, it's impossible to replicate NATO's capabilities in the European Union. And there are treaties that I mentioned, uh, fiscal uh, treaties that prevent uh, debt ceilings and so forth, right? So you cannot break those and <clears throat> spent unbelievable amount of resources, capital to build that. There is a level of integration, but it's, it's, a, it's a midget compared to NATO in the EU. The other thing is integration of the uh, military defense industries in Europe. That is fundamental as well. There's too much replication uh, if you look at them individually. Literally, uh, you need to reach economies of scale there, just like the uh, uh, aircraft, commercial aircraft industries and aerospace industries. Other things need to be integrated. France recently came back into NATO's military wing. Um, and by staying away for so long, it didn't integrate really well its defense industries with the rest. NATO is a very complex and very expensive uh, institution. And, <coughs> excuse me, heavy lift capability is fundamental. 90% of heavy lift capability in NATO is American. And to be at the same level of capability, we're talking about hundreds and hundreds of heavy lift aircraft and that sort of capability. So when Europeans need it, they get it from NATO. I once asked uh, this question, where does the rest of 10% come from? I'm gonna research this one day. I think it was at a conference at, at Boazici and the British consular was sitting in the front uh, row and he said, I'll tell you where it is. It's the Ukrainian aircraft that we rent and you pay for. Uh, <laughs> I just about fell out of my chair. Uh, it, it's, if you notice that expansion of NATO and enlargement of EU went parallel. And that was deliberate. That was very deliberate. Initially, following the French idea, Europeans fo pushed for EU alone uh, alternative in the Maastricht Treaty. And then Bosnia happened. 
And then they realize they don't have the means to deal with it. And at the end, they had to call NATO in. And by uh, the next treaty, they had to revise it and say, EU-NATO partnership. That has been the principle since then. Now, I am very worried well, about what Trump caused in the transatlantic alliance. He caused a tremendous damage in the cohesiveness and the level of trust in, in NATO. Um, remember the formula I was showing you, conflict cooperation? We did this study, uh, you know, what does it look like if China was to rise against United States and so forth, the probability of conflict increases. And probability of conflict between China and EU increases over time as China rises. China is violating everything I used to think of China as this neutral power, the sleeping giant that burned its navy 500 years ago and became insular. Now they are everywhere, very aggressive, incredibly aggressive and ready to take on the United States. And the future scenario that worries me is where the more problems Putin has with the West and he's pushing that to stay in power more and more he is going to rely on Chinese support. And this coalition that's emerging between Russia and China, this cooperation, not that they love each other, but also remember they signed a huge economic treaty and energy treaty. They're building energy pipelines from Siberia to China, uh, will become the block against EU. EU needs NATO. We need a transatlantic alliance in this rising, challenging, uh, <clears throat> the, the, the um, new alliance, Eurasia alliance. Where India would, would fit, I don't know. We can uh, debate that, uh, but that's another sleeping giant that's rising. Um, but notice, if you go and read the military doctrine, recent military doctrine of Russia, they're very proud of their information warfare capabilities to dismantle democracies from within. And they're doing that very effectively, cyber, cyber warfare. And they're in social media, creating mistrust among people, towards their governments, they're fueling uh, this mistrust, they're creating uh, false information and feeding that constantly, and they're proud of it. They're open about it. It's published. It's one of their, uh, if they call it the cognitive side of cyber warfare, information warfare. The other side is physical cyber attacks. The other, the flip side of the coin is, is the cognitive psychological warfare. And they're very effective because they do know uh, they're not gonna take the United States or NATO directly. They cannot sustain a long uh, lasting war. Russia's economy is flat and it's declining. But China on the other hand, isn't. And both China and Russia, and now uh, increasingly Iran, North Korea, have developed uh, organized cyber armies and they are changing the nature of warfare, literally. But it doesn't fit anything. It doesn't fit any traditional agreements on warfare. Thank you, Hojam. Um, thank you for the whole uh, wonderful evening. Uh, it was a pleasure to listen to your research. And thank I you. Um, I really enjoyed it. Thank you very much for coming. Um, I hope to see you someday in person. 
uh, hopefully. Uh, and if not in Turkey, maybe uh, next ISA, God willing, <laughs> we shall see. Certainly, Ojam, and I also hope that we can also have you here at Bilkent at some point. Hope so. Hope so. Thank you very much. Thank you. Have a I nice really day. appreciate it. Thanks a Thank lot. You. Thanks a lot, everyone, for coming. Bye-bye. Have a good evening. You too.